Thanks so much, Joe, and welcome again, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here uh, to sort of dive into this really important and also interesting topic. Um, I think we all know that the extractive industry has been hit really hard by the pandemic, along with economies more broadly, of course, um, all across the world. And as we look toward the recovery, governments in resource-rich countries will be relying on extractive revenues to help fund services and build back better. <clears throat> that means that rebuilding a transparent, accountable, and cost-effective industry is essential as we look toward the future. And suppliers will be a key part of that as they're what really make the industry tick. Companies operating in the extractive sector spend as much as $1 trillion a year on the procurement of goods and services from suppliers. And this scale of spending brings both challenges and opportunities, as we'll see shortly. This is an emerging area of interest for the EITI itself, but there are already some companies, governments, and partner organizations that are recognizing the importance of supplier governance and developing innovative new practices around transparency in the space. My organization, the Open Contracting Partnership, is doing a lot of thinking about these issues in procurement more broadly. So it's a real honor for me to be here with this awesome panel to hear about what's already being done and what more we can collectively do to advance supplier transparency. So before we get started, I'll quickly introduce our panelists in order of appearance, of course. Um, first, we'll hear from Rob Pittman, who's a senior governance officer at the Natural Resource Governance Institute, and he'll help us to set the stage on the topic. Next, we'll have a government perspective from Walid Nasser, who's the acting chairman of the board and the head of the strategic planning department at the Lemonese Petroleum Administration. We'll then hear from Daniel Driscoll, vice president of legal and compliance at Endeavor Mining, to learn what companies can do to help foster supplier transparency. Next up, we'll be treated to a brief video recording from Sylvia Buchan, who's the supply chain manager of the UK's Oil and Gas Authority. Unfortunately, she can't be with us in person, but we're pleased to her colleague, Chris Diggle, who's the supply chain action plan manager, will join us for the question and answer session. And last, but certainly not least, before we open it up to your questions, we'll hear from Ines Marquez, who's the policy director at the EITI International Secretariat to share some of their plans for next steps. Each of our panelists will have about five minutes for their interventions. And after that, if there's time left, I might abuse my role as moderator to ask a follow-up, but then I'll open it up to all of you. So as Joe said, feel free to pop questions in the chat as we go for our speakers. Now, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Rob Pittman of NRGI, who's one of the authors of Beneath the Surface, a recent report on supplier governance that provides a really useful overview of the main players and what's at stake. Over to you, Rob. Before Rob jumps in, I want to say, can, can questions please be put into the Q&A, um, the Q&A function on the, on, thank you. Thanks, Kerry. Over to you, Rob. Um, thanks very much. And th thanks very much for having me and for, for the introduction, Kerry. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here today discussing such an important issue. Um, I'd like to set the scene by discussing three things. First, I'd like to talk about the roles that suppliers play in the industry. Second, um, what's at stake for um, governments, companies, and citizens. And third, what governments and companies are actually doing to improve transparency at the moment. So I'll just um, get right in there. Um, in terms of the roles um, suppliers play, I think that because of the way the industry is organized, most of us, when we think about extractive industry projects, we normally think about them in terms of the big name exploration and production companies that own the rights to explore or exploit natural resources. Private sector companies like BHP or Exxon or SOEs like Gazprom or Cadelco. Um, but doing this hides the important fact that most extractive industry activity um, today wouldn't be possible without the multitude of, of service of suppliers, um, that provide the goods and services needed to take natural resources out of the ground. These companies are used at all stages of extractive industry projects during exploration, development, operations, maintenance, um, and decommissioning. Some suppliers might do all of these things, while others um, might be highly specialized and provide products only at a particular stage um, or for a particular process. Um, and suppliers range inside from multi-million dollar um, international conglomerates like Slumberger or Caterpillar to specialized or local firms that maybe only have a handful of employees. So what's at stake for governments, companies and citizens? Um, to put it simply, a lot of money. Um, using industry data from Reistad and SMP, um, we at NRGI estimate that 
around two thirds of every dollar spent in the extractive industries goes to suppliers. And this totals as much as $1 trillion a year globally before the pandemic, just for the upstream alone. Um, at this scale, the way that spending on suppliers is managed clearly has consequences for how much profit and taxable income um, extractive industries generate. Um, and it also provides a really important opportunity for countries to build local content. Um, the other side of this, and the slightly more sinister side, is that um, the amount of money spent on suppliers also presents an opportunity for corrupt interests um, to profit. Um, just analyzing cases brought um, under the US Foreign and um, Corrupt Practices Act, we see that suppliers are involved in most accusations of wrongdoing in the extractive industry. So what's being done? Um, here I have two stories. Um, first, there's a negative story that centers on the fact that few governments and companies publish anything like systematic information on extractive industry suppliers. This means that it's really difficult to determine the scales and the benefits, um, uh, the scale of the benefits and challenges um, brought by suppliers, the policies that are working and those which aren't, and who's performing well and who's not. Um, but that's not the whole story. There is also a positive story. And that's because some suppliers, um, well, sorry, some companies and governments recognize the issues that um, I've outlined and are taking um, steps of their own to improve supplier transparency. And there's three main ways in which this is happening. Um, first, we're seeing um, information being published about procurement processes. Companies like Rio Tinto in Mongolia and government authorities such as the UK um, are putting together disclosure tools that facilitate um, disclosure of information, including procurement processes, upcoming tenders, awards, and identities of suppliers. Um, one really interesting example that we're going to hear from in, in, this, um, in this webinar is the LPA in Lebanon, um, who are publishing a list of suppliers alongside beneficial ownership information for each of these suppliers. Um, this information is super useful for building public trust, but also for local content, because it means that local businesses have a better awareness of procurement opportunities and how to apply for them. They also know which companies to follow up with for subcontracting opportunities. So that's the first area where we're seeing progress. The second area relates to spending on suppliers. Um, for a long time, the amount spent on suppliers um, has, has really only been given to us in sort of general global spending um, figures that we see in sustainability reports. But some companies are, are now increasing the level of detail um, about this spending to make it more useful. Um, one group of companies um, is following um, a standard called the Local Procurement Reporting Mechanism in the mining sector. Um, and they're providing project specific um, um, reporting on total spend and they're disaggregating that between local and international companies. And I'm pleased to say Taranga Gold, now owned by Endeavor, who are also on this panel, are implementing this. Um, this information is super useful to understand what's at stake for and, and plan for local procurement, but it's also really helpful to communicate the benefits of extractive industry projects. Um, the third area where we're seeing um, emerging supplier um, transparency relates to um, supplier contribution to tax revenues. And this is an area where there's surprisingly little concrete policy guidance for governments. Um, so publishing this information helps understand um, and build better tax policies, but it also helps understand the broader economic contributions provided by suppliers. Um, interestingly, innovations here are being driven by a number of EITI processes, including Mali and Guinea, who are including suppliers in their payments to government's disclosures. So I'd now like to conclude, and, and just a few points just to wrap up. I'd like to say, firstly, that you know a lot of a lot is at stake for suppliers, um, but um, but still, um, this area of transparency is lagging behind other areas of extractive industry transparency. Um, second, um, you know, we are seeing um, some actions by companies, governments, and EITI processes that provide some cause for optimism. But because this is done in an ad hoc way, we're going to face a coordination challenge to make these disclosures more widespread, consistent, and useful going forward. Um, and addressing this coordination challenge is where I think that international internet initiatives like EITI can play a really important role. Um, I'm really looking forward to hearing um, from the other panelists and to the discussion that's going to follow. Thanks very much.
Great, thanks so much, Rob. A, a really good sort of bird's eye view of, of all of the different um, pieces of the puzzle um, and touching on where things are, are already moving in the right direction. Um, I did have a couple of questions that I noted down as you were speaking, but unfortunately you've already gone over your time. Um, so we're gonna move on to the next speaker, but encourage everyone that's here to, first of all, read the report. It's actually really interesting. Um, and also any questions that you have for Rob, um, as well as our other speakers, pop them in the Q&A as we go. Um, so now I'm excited to turn over to Walid Nasser from the Lebanese Petroleum Administration, who will walk us through LPA's recent experience um, from the government side. Walid. Hello, everyone. And uh, thanks to the AITI Secretariat for organizing this uh, webinar and inviting Lebanon to present our small experience uh, Lebanon is a newcomer to the oil and gas industry, and we tried to establish uh, a sector that is based on strong pillars for transparency and accountability. So we have set in place a legal framework, which is complete, and uh, it goes into details of every single aspect of the oil and gas sector from exploration up to decommissioning. And along uh, this uh, legal framework, what is relevant to this seminar today is the issue of procurement and uh, uh, disclosures in this respect. So uh, what the legal framework sets is that we have to have competitive licensing rounds to start with, where oil and gas companies need to compete to get an award. And we have a production sharing system in place. And this is the type of contracts that we sign with oil and gas companies. Within the contract, uh, the first step that the Lebanese Petroleum Administration has done is that we had published the actually signed contracts, the production sharing contracts between the government and these companies. And this was a breakthrough uh, uh, in this system as a first step to show the citizens and the sector in general that we are really based on transparency and the, the, the contracts are published. And these contracts also include the procurement and recruitment processes that the operator needs to conduct for the contractors and subcontractors, even for recruitment, where the recruitment of national uh, personnel needs to be advertised on several websites and uh, a recruitment process needs to be uh, conducted. In this aspect, uh, for the procurement also, the law and the application decrees are all published and they outline clearly the procurement procedures and the disclosure requirements. And Lebanon was really interested in to join the EITI and we did some preparatory steps in that aspect. But uh, in parallel and until we reach our candidature and hopefully become members of the EITI, uh, the government has opted to integrate the EITI standard and several international transparency measures into a legal framework. So a special law was adopted by the parliament, which is enhancing transparency in the oil and gas sector, which is a very specific law for the sector that highlights all the requirements needed for the government and for the companies to implement transparency uh, uh, standards, as well as the parliament has also ratified a law for public access to information where any person, Lebanese or non-Lebanese, can ask for uh, additional information or disclosures from any public institution. And for that, we have a special section on our website where people can pose their requests and we provide the relevant information. So in the legal framework, procurement that has to be done by the operator needs to follow an open tender procedure for major contracts and a competitive tender procedure for all other contracts. So the operator needs to advertise for the services or the goods required and service companies or suppliers need to apply and the operator will have to select the best offer. And the LPA as a regulator can audit this process and check whether the operator has actually abided by all the measures required. In addition to that, which is a very important aspect is the disclosure. In addition to the signed contracts that were disclosed in terms of the award for exploration and production, we have published the list of uh, subcontractors, the name of the company, the service that was required or the goods supplied, and most importantly, the beneficial owners of these companies. And uh, this was also a breakthrough because it is not a very common practice to be done. However, uh, we decided to do that with the objective of enhancing transparency and accountability. 
uh, especially that this sector in Lebanon is being is a new sector and it's gaining a lot of attention by the public and the media. So uh, we wanted to be really transparent because there were a lot of question marks saying that, okay, you did a compet good competitive licensing rounds. However, the issues may be in the contracting and the subcontracting. So this is why actually we published the list of contracts and from the names of the companies of the contract, of the contractors, it shows that all of these companies are experienced companies that are relevant to the services required. And the beneficial owners of these companies are not uh, politically exposed personnel in Lebanon. And this was very important for the sector and for the credibility of the sector and of the companies working in Lebanon. And this was actually published and uh, done. Uh, we are now uh, working on a draft decree that goes even beyond this disclosure to, uh, to basically start disclosing parts of the contracts and the subcontracts. Uh, of course, keeping the confidential information confidential, such as the patents or the very uh, technical information or the very critical financial information, keep them confidential. However, to start disclosing parts of the contracts in addition to the names and the beneficial owners of these companies. Um, this was done uh, in the last month after the, doing the first exploration well in Lebanon. And actually it was very well received by the operator to start with, by the consortium of companies working in Lebanon, which I take the opportunity to thank because they were very cooperative. And they are actually supporters to the EITI and the companies are Total, ENI and uh, Novatech. And actually all the contractors also were cooperative and uh, they didn't have issues in publishing their names or their beneficial owners. And it was done in a smooth way in a very cooperative manner between the LPA and these companies. And actually uh, we got very good feedback also from the parliament, from uh, the civil society organizations in Lebanon who are monitoring this sector and they regularly publish the articles or reports on the performance of the sector and the transparency measures uh, undertaken. Uh, also in terms of disclosure, we also disclosed, we did a lot of seismic surveys offshore Lebanon based on multi-client surveys where the companies do the uh, surveys at their own cost and then they sell the licenses to oil companies to use the data and the government has a profit share from these contracts. And we also publish the profit that is coming to the government from these seismic surveys on our website, uh, which also completes the picture. Hoping that uh, if we get to the production phase that we will also be publishing production data and revenues. Uh, I think I have the five minutes now. <laughs> uh, I can go more into details, of course, if time allows or if you have additional questions. Great, no, that's wonderful. And that was, um, I was just about to cut you off. So perfect timing. Um, and I think really interesting to see sort of how disclosure and transparency in different parts of the process um, have, have, have come out. Um, personally, I'm especially interested in how it sounds like open contracting has been especially useful for building trust. And we'll take that offline, but keen to dig more into that um, on a personal note. Uh, so thank you so much. Um, good food for thought for both EITI implementing countries as well as um, those working toward membership. Uh, now for a company perspective, um, I'll hand over to Daniel Driscoll from Endeavor Mining for his thoughts. Daniel. Great, thanks. Um, well, firstly, thank you uh, to EITI for the opportunity uh, uh, for Endeavor to appear and, and share with everyone a bit of what we're doing um, in this area. Um, you know, I think the first point I'd like to note is that um, Legal obligations requiring businesses to understand who they're doing business with you know, are, are not new. Um, you know, we've had uh, international sanctions rules, uh, the way international um, anti-corruption legislation works, you know, has always required businesses to have some understanding and look into some of these issues. W what's new is we're starting to see laws come out that are taking this further. Um, you know, the UK Modern Slavery Act, for instance, in the UK, you know, uh, applies now globally. Uh, so, and, and so this legislation is requiring, um, and other legislation like it, companies to really kind of understand um, who they're doing business with uh, and ensuring that those business partners are you know, respecting the environment and human rights, combating corruption, uh, and even new legislation requiring businesses to make sure that the business partners are paying their taxes, meeting their fiscal obligations. Um, 
you know, companies are also starting to do this voluntarily. Um, you know, the, the, the focus on ESG means that uh, companies are ensuring that uh, the people with whom they do business um, meet their values. Um, and, and this is an area where, um, you know, we've found that third party screening tools can be quite effective. The, these are things that banks and professional services firms have used for some time uh, to, to, to screen their clients and under, you know, under KYC rules. Um, but it's becoming more and more common for industrials to incorporate technology like this and processes like this um, into their compliance framework. Um, you know, I think this is also an area where good process can be a competitive advantage um, because you know, in, in addition to screening your own business partners and, and looking at your own supply chain, um, you know, industrials have to be prepared that their banks and their investors are going to be looking at them. Uh, and, you know, our experience and my experience has been that, you know, when you are scrutinized, um, you need to be able to explain your process, how it works, uh, and make sure that your lenders and other business partners can get comfortable with, with you. Um, um, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, another area where we're seeing this develop is in um, uh, the fight against climate change. Um, whilst greenhouse gas report, uh, uh, reporting uh, on scope three emissions, which are the emissions of your suppliers, uh, is not yet mandatory in all cases. Um, you know, Well-advised companies are starting to um, collect this data and, and track this data. Um, now, you know, there, there's still a lot of, the understanding of scope three emissions is still developing and I think there's still some issues that need to be worked out there. Um, you know, but you know, there's data suggesting that your scope three emissions in some industries can make up, you know, the bulk of, of your greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so understanding this aspect of your, your supply chain uh, is critical to understanding your own greenhouse gas emissions and, and achieving your own CO2 emission reduction goals. Um, I think the, the challenge for, for industrials is, uh, and extractive companies is balancing these international obligations against your local content obligations. Um, and this is where there's a need to have um, a clear and objective framework uh, that both industry and the host nations respect to help ensure that companies can procure locally without ending up offsides on, on their values or their international commitments. Um, and, and this is an area where, you know, for major resources companies, um, you know, they have the, the bulk and the weight and the processes to, to say no. Um, when the, the local procurement rules, you know, they, they can't get comfortable with the local procurement rules. Um, you know, the, the majors also tend to be more highly regulated and their approach to compliance in this area uh, reflects that risk profile. Um, but it becomes more challenging for smaller extractive companies who don't necessarily have the ability to say no. Um, you know, they tend to be less, uh, less regulated um, and, and their approach to risk reflects that. Um, they also tend to have fewer processes uh, which make it a bit harder um, to, to fall back on process uh, to say no. Um, but, but I think more critically for smaller extractive companies, you know, the, the, the existence of the company, the viability of the company can often depend on, on a single project or a single permit. And, and that can create an incentive to, to cut corners or, or potentially compromise on values. So um, this is an area where, uh, um, you know, the international community can play a role um, in, in developing a framework uh, that can, can provide um, uh, uh, guidance for the extractives companies and the host nations uh, to ensure that the local content commitments can be realized in a manner that's consistent with the highest standards of, of, of transparency um, and compliance. Um, and this is, as Rob already mentioned, the, um, the local pre uh, procurement reporting mechanism um, has been developed to, to, to fill this gap. Um, uh, I believe Endeavor Mining is the largest company so far to, to sign up to the LPMR. Uh, and the aims of, of, of this initiative are, are to um, improve internal management uh, in mining companies to create more benefits for the host countries uh, and strengthen their social license to operate, uh, to empower suppliers, and, uh, host governments and other stakeholders with practical information uh, that helps them collaborate with the mining industry. And um, also uh, to increase transparency in procurement processes to, 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 to fight issues like corruption. Um, and I think we're getting a bit short on time. So I'll just wrap up um, you know, with one point that I think is actually a key point to note for extractive companies, which is that you know, there tends to be a lot of focus on our own supply chains, but it's important to remember that in most cases, we're actually in the middle of the process. 
Um, you know, and, uh, you know, we supply raw materials to refiners or processors um, and programs like the Kimberley process for diamonds or single mine origin for gold uh, can be really useful in, in confirming the provenance of these resources so that the end us users can be comfortable that, um, you know, the gold they're buying or the diamonds they're buying have been uh, um, uh, responsibly sourced. So. Awesome, thank you. And I think that that last point is a really interesting one that um, sometimes gets lost when we, we go deep in some of these questions. So um, really interesting to, to help sort of situate the conversation both in terms of the, the broader supply chain and then also mentioning the, the interplay between international and local um, standards, context, regulations, et cetera. So um, thanks so much for that. Um, and now we're gonna go extra virtual if, if that's a thing. Um, and we'll hear from Sylvia Buchan at the UK Oil and Gas Authority. Um, she's prepared a video recording for us to introduce Pathfinder Energy, which is a really interesting example of a tool for supplier transparency, sort of a one-stop shop for information on upcoming opportunities in the oil and gas supply chain. So let's see what she has to say. My name is Sylvia Buchan, and I'm the Supply Chain Manager at the Oil and Gas Authority. I'm sorry I'm not able to give a live presentation today. I hope our recorded session will explain the background and the objectives of our recently in launched Enhanced Energy Pathfinder system. I'm pleased to say that my colleague Chris Diggle, however, will be joining you live and he will answer any questions that you may have. So Pathfinder was originally created about 10 years ago to provide visibility of upcoming activity on UKCS. Um, we realised what was needed was a digital platform to capture and to share information of energy, of emerging project, project activity on a real-time basis. So while the original system provided basic details such as the name of the project, the window of opportunity and contact details, we realised there were other important areas that could now be captured and these are now provided in our enhanced um, system and it really does make it a useful and enabling tool for the whole industry. So we've now included um, a function which allows operators to seek innovative solutions uh, to help unlock you know, stranded projects and also to seek immediate solutions to any struggles and challenges that they may be facing with that project. And it's also set to be the vehicle that's going to drive collaborative supply chain campaigns, such as well plug and abandonment of um, suspended wells. So I'm now going to share a video with you. Project Pathfinder was launched in 2010 to provide visibility of upcoming contract opportunities to the supply chain on the UK continental shelf. It was based on three key criteria, details of the contract, window of opportunity, and contact details for relevant person at the operator. Sylvia Buchan said, Project Pathfinder, now known as Energy Pathfinder, has been revamped and extended to meet the changing needs of the industry and help operators and supply companies from all tiers work together successfully. It has been a huge success. There are now over 1,000 subscribers regularly using the system and currently there are over 100 project opportunities listed. Ryan Scott said, we utilised OGA's Pathfinder to engage with the supply chain and pursue an alternative contracting solution, which has the potential to successfully develop our marginal Ravel discovery. Ole Udson said, as a leading and innovative decom player, we use the monthly updates available in the Energy Pathfinder as a key source of intel and data. We appreciate the initiative taken by OGA to enhance this tool, which will help us in building and executing the multi-operator campaigns, which will be the next step in transforming the industry's decommissioning cost performance. Features include Details of which Tier 1 supplier has won a contract which helps smaller suppliers bid for subcontracts. Collaboration opportunities. Operators actively seeking suggestions for innovative solutions for challenges they face. Forward work plan information. Maintenance and operations contracts will be available. 
More detailed information on projects, including wells to be decommissioned and campaign opportunities. Upcoming tenders, information on opportunities coming to the market. Mechanism to drive multi-operator project campaigns. User-friendly public interface, including interactive map and filter and search mechanisms. Regular email updates of opportunities to subscribers. And energy transition work, focusing on carbon capture and storage, low carbon power, hydrogen and floating wind, and forward work plans, which will give details of upcoming tenders for operations and maintenance contracts will be available. For more information, visit our website. So we engage with the operators at an early stage of projects. That's from discovery through the development, the decommissioning, and now also energy transition. And the, pro and the operators or developers, they will upload information onto the Energy Pathfinder portal. So to access the Pathfinder interface, you go onto the OG website, and I've highlighted the Pathfinder um, logo there. So you just click on that, and it will take you to this page and you access it uh, through, again, I've highlighted the supply chain. And then once you're in there, this is where you start to get the information. This on our home page here, uh, along the top, we've listed all the different sections. Um, and on the front page here, it tells you about the tenders, the contracts and collaborations. And you just click on them. I've highlighted down at the bottom there, click to see more tenders. So if you clicked on the tenders at the top there, the upcoming tenders 29, you wanted to see some more, you click on that button there. And then this one here is just a list of all the current projects. So as you can see on there, we've got 14 discovery, 42 development, 880 commissioning, and we've got four energy transition projects at the moment. So we're proud of, of this tool. Um, it, it has been created for the industry to help with obtaining project information and given visibility of current activity, collaboration opportunities, uh, for challenges and engagement between um, the operators and the supply chain. There are currently, as I said earlier, 140 projects and that's from 36 uh, operators on Pathfinder. So we believe it is a unique, um, sophisticated, useful industry tool, and I hope you will enjoy exploring the functions and the information that is, that is held on the system. So, I wish you all a, a really successful event and I hope you all have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much. Fantastic, a really uh, interesting opportunity of um, sort of seeing on the screen the, the whole process that Wally mentioned. Um, and also curious to sort of dig into the energy transition which she mentioned in passing. But I think in the interest of time, I'll, I'll come back to that in the, the Q&A um, and instead hand it over to Ines Marquez who's joining us from the EITI Secretariat um, to share a bit on, on their thoughts um, for next steps. Yes. Thank you very much, Kerry. Um, and, and thanks for all the interventions uh, so far. I think they really demonstrate that there is a lot happening in this space. Uh, while there's some clear opportunities to bring together experiences and standardized reporting in a way that can contribute to improved supplier governance. DITI countries such as Senegal, uh, Guinea, Mali, Iraq, and Tanzania are among those that have used the EITI process to address some of the areas that Rob mentioned are important for supplier governance. Um, this includes looking at how much extractive um, companies spend on suppliers, who own, service, um, who own service contractors and suppliers, what the local content is in the supply uh, of goods and services, and how much suppliers are paying in taxes to government. This is not something that the EITR requires, but these implementing countries have decided to expand um, the EITI uh, reporting to cover different aspects related to the supply of goods and services to the extractive industries um, that are important in their national context. And we want to build on these innovations, as well as the good practices we've heard about today from um, Lebanon and from the UK, and draw lessons learned and share these with uh, the EITI community and beyond. 
So this is uh, this webinar is uh, is our, our our effort to to launch these discussions, and we plan to convene further discussions with partners and stakeholders in the coming months um, on particular issues, including procurement rules and, and processes, supplier identities, and local pro procurement and spending. Um, to learn uh, to learn more and, and hear more from from you. We also want to explore how existing reporting guidance by the EITI and partners related to the supply of goods and services can be used for member countries uh, and supporting companies who are interested in uh, strengthening disclosures in this area. Um, we also plan to reach out to and consult um, suppliers as, as well to explore potential partnerships as they also have a key role to play to promote good supplier governance. So we do welcome all suggestions on how we can uh, best uh, play a role to advance transparency in this area and, and look forward to hearing from, from all of you in the discussion. Thanks, Gary. No, thank you, Ines. And um, I think I can speak on behalf of all of us that we're really keen to support you as this moves forward and, and really looking forward to those next steps. Um, now the moment we've all been waiting for, I'll open it up to the audience for questions. We've got um, a, a handful in the chat, so I'm um, sorry, Q&A feature, um, subtle but important distinction. Uh, so please continue to add those. Um, and if I can open it up, um, I think I will, however, follow up on um, the, the one that I teed up earlier on the energy transition. I feel like this is sort of the, the elephant in, in the room. Um, Sylvia mentioned it briefly in her, um, in her remarks as an aspect of the revamped Pathfinder. So keen to hear maybe from Chris on thoughts and, and others who I know are thinking about this um, on how, whether and how maybe disclosures will, um, will change and what role supplier transparency will have moving forward in this. Um, and please continue to to add your questions um, as we go. Anybody want to take that one? Chris, over to you. I can go for it. <laughs> I can try anyway. Um, <clears throat> I think the energy transition has caught everyone a little unawares. I think if we've been talking about the energy transition 18 months ago, I think there would have been a slightly different conversation. Um, but I think over the past year, I think obviously with the pandemic and, and the like, and everything else that's going on in the world, there's been a real acceleration of, of energy transition projects. You know, the race to race 2050 and net zero, I think is very important. And I think treating the supply chain and having that transparency of upcoming work and, and who's winning contracts, who's getting awarded contracts, I think is incredibly important. And hopefully that's where the Pathfinder tool is going to sit. Showing that holistic picture of, of, of cradle to grave contracts and tenders coming up and, and awards being made. Um, we also have another process we call it the supply chain action plan process that we have at the OGA. And this is effectively looking at the, the operators and licensees, their contracting strategies before before they go ahead and reach final investment decision. Uh, I press the green button and, and go ahead with the project. So all of these project, all of these um, contract strategies are reviewed and approved by us. So we will see a full list um, as a government organization of all tenderers. Um, we obviously don't make these public because it is confidential, an awful lot of confidential information in there. But then that information, once contracts are awarded, is translated over onto the Pathfinder system. The same thing then will happen, I think, in the energy transition piece. And I think it's incredibly important that we have that transparency because it also allows those those companies lower down the tier to try and get work with the sort of the tier ones, the top tier one contractors, suppliers. Harry, can I um, come in on that question? Absolutely, go for it. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think I think it is a really interesting um, point. You know, this is this is the the big sort of external force sort of um, um, coming up against the extractive industries at the moment. Um, and I, I think I think that um, I think that it sort of actually does push the impetus more to to disclose information about suppliers for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, I think you know we're, we're in the oil and gas industry. We're going to see um, potentially, you know, looking to the future, lower prices in the long run and sh shorter time horizons for projects to run. And I think in that context, understanding um, the broader benefits of these projects, i.e., you know, the the way that they interact with the local economy is going to be and and the global economy is going to be a big part of understanding the justification and the cost benefit analysis of these projects. So, so supplier, supplier transparency is key to that. Um, and I also think, uh, you know, it's also important to understand, you know, even under these, you know, these scenarios that we've been hearing about recently um, from the IEA, you know, about 
you know, the, the number of new projects we're going to see. Um, even, even under, you know, the, those most extreme examples, there's still huge amounts of supplier activity that will be going on. Um, I was just looking at a Reistad webinar recently that was saying, we expect the same number of supply contracts in 2027 as in 20, 2019. So, you know, the, we're still, we're still going to see some of that. Um, and, um, yeah, um, and, and I think, I think it's just important to sort of flag as well that, you know, suppliers are very, very heavily involved in a lot of these, um, these processes such as carbon capture storage, but also be very involved in, in decommissioning and, and um, rehabilitation of project sites. So just important things to note. Awesome, thanks. Thanks so much to you both. And I think a lot of different um, aspects to keep in mind and uh, maybe, maybe a topic for, for a future uh, seminar in and of itself. Um, great, thanks. Uh, I will turn to, uh, in the Q&A, um, there's a, a question, I think, Wally, this was for you from Frederick. Um, you said that two parts of the contract are kept confidential. Um, one was the technical part and the other piece. Um, and I'm going to add on to that and ask um, if you could broaden that out a bit and, and thinking about from your experience, what advice you would have for countries that are considering supplier transparency requirements um, or advice for the EITI itself on, on how they can support that. Uh, thank you, Kerry, for the questions. Uh, basically, uh, what I was mentioning is that now we are drafting a new application decree that allows us to publish the contracts of the subcontractors, not of the award for the oil and gas exploration and production. And uh, taking into account that there are some confidential information usually in these contracts, uh, some that are related to some very specific technical uh, specifications or uh, approaches or technologies that some companies may use and they would not like to disclose in detail. And the other part is related to the financial information, which is related to competitiveness or to how they cost actually their projects, which is also maybe kept confidential because it, it, it affects the competition, not only for the companies, but also for the government, because in the coming tenders, uh, it would be good to keep this competition and the competitive edge of the companies that provide the best prices and the least cost. This is now being under uh, evaluation and study so that we complete the draft and submit it to the government uh, sometime soon. As for your question related to, to the, our experience and uh, our advice, basically we are newcomers, so <laughs> maybe I'm not in a position to provide a lot of advice, but uh, our experience shows that if you, as since the beginning, if there's the will of the government is basically to put a transparent and accountable system in place, then the first step is to have a very solid legal framework uh, that is also very clear uh, from the beginning so that investors, whether oil and gas companies or service companies, they know where they are coming to and they would not have surprises. And if it is clear from the beginning, then of course, all the companies would study these, the legal framework and how it affects their business. So if they agree to that and they come to the country and start investing, it means that they are in agreement. And then it becomes very much easier to work with these companies and publish and disclose the information requested. If this legal framework is obscure or not clear, then it may open up uh, the door for some misunderstandings maybe, or some reluctance from the companies or some authorities to, to do so. So a clear legal framework is crucial. And then uh, to show the companies the willingness of the government to do so, and I think reputable companies who are uh, really aware of their work and they would like to keep up their reputation and their competitive edge, they will be in a positive mode of collaboration with the government. And this is what happened here. So that there was no issues and this would give credibility for the companies also not for the government alone. Uh, this shows that what they are doing is in line with the rules and regulations and it is uh, it is fair and ethical and uh, this would add up to their image and to their reporting on transparency and and uh, even on uh, we, we are thinking of environmental reporting also which also adds up 
to, to the whole picture, given all the discussion being done on climate change and pollution and reducing emissions. So the package would be uh, really very interesting for both the host government and the companies to do so. And uh, my advice is to, is to go through the, on this track because it is very beneficial for both. Awesome. No, I think that that makes sense coming from um, also a, a more pure procurement perspective. Uh, I think some of those points really resonate. Um, and I would I would say that you might actually have a little bit more flexibility because you are newer. So some of the innovations that you're testing, exactly. out, even though you say you don't have much experience, um, I think it's a really interesting example that others can can follow too. So um, would not would not put that down. Um, and a quick pitch on the original question, um, we at Open Contracting Partnership have developed a myth busting report um, that looks at commercial confidentiality. And so there are some points in there that, that might be useful for the broader um, conversation as well. Um, great, thank you, Walid. Um, you. Great, questions coming in, perfect. Um, I will send one over to Daniel um, if you wanna take um, this sort of broader question on um, going down the supply chain, your buyer for gold, uh, and whether or not you should be able to, to encourage your buyers to also disclose uh, information as well. It's sort of a, a heady one if you're, you're up for taking that. We can't hear you, you're muted. My, my apologies. Okay. Um, no, I, I think, um... You know, it touches on, on, on a point, um, the point that I concluded on, you know, this idea that, you know, and, and the importance to remember that the extractive companies sit in the middle of the value chain. Um, and a lot of these discussions, a lot of the laws, the regulations tends to be backward looking, um, you know, but, you know, it, the value chain continues. Um, and that's where initiatives like, you know, we had, you know, the, the Kimberley process is, is well known and well established uh, for combating blood diamonds. Um, you know, we have conflict minerals rules um, and international rules around that. And, and increasingly, you know, uh, it, we endeavor as a part of um, the single mine origin gold initiative, which is an idea that, um, you know, when the gold shows up, you know, and, and increasingly the, the jewelry is still the, the, the largest source uh, uh, and use of gold. Um, and, and when that jewelry ends up you know, in, you know, whatever, you know, high, high street shop, it, it's, it's giving the consumer comfort that, you know, that gold ring or that gold necklace, you know, that, you know, the environment hasn't been damaged, that, you know, human uh, beings haven't been exploited, um, that, you know, corruption and, you know, all the kind of, um, uh, kind of things associated with that and kind of undermining democracy and the rule of law. Um, um, so you know that, that's where single mine origin is is critical. Um, you know, and there's it could be entirely another discussion around you know the various ways in which gold is sourced. They're you know responsible miners, uh, and then you get into kind of ASM mining, which is an entirely different kettle of fish, and not for today. Um, but you know, initiatives like this are um, important differentiators, um, and 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 can provide competitive advantages for extractive companies um, because it is expensive to follow the rules and it is expensive to do things properly. Um, and that's why it's also uh, important to recognize um, uh, when the end product is is sourced responsibly. And you know, you know, the, the idea that th those things do matter to consumers, um, and that's why giving comfort and, and certainty uh, on, on how these things are produced is is, is important. And I think um, increasingly, increasingly so, and increasingly spotlighted. So I think that's a, a great point. And I'm very happy to pick up the, the conversation on artisanal mining as, as you know, we sort of chatted on that yesterday. So yeah. um, we'll leave that for the next webinar. Um, thanks, Daniel. And a couple of questions for Chris that I'll sort of package and send your way. Um, first, uh, has the OGA evaluated how Pathfinder has been able to support your mission to maximize economic recovery? And coupled with that, um, a question on it seems um, it captures opportunities for potential supplier contracts, but not the contracts themselves. So if you could speak to that quickly. Yep. <clears throat> so Mo UK is obviously incredibly important still for us as part of our strategy, uh, maximizing uh, economic recovery. Um, Pathfinder does play a, a quite a key role in this. Um, as the basin has matured over the past decades, 
um, there are more and more stranded, what we call stranded fields, um, fields that perhaps on their own are a little un uneconomic. Pathfinder is a tool now where we can allow operators to speak to each other and seek collaboration opportunities to either develop or on the flip side of the back end decommission um, assets. In addition to that, I think in Sylvia's uh, video, uh, CNOC um, have, a, have a project called Revel, uh, which is, is sub-economic at the minute. Um, they have used the Pathfinder system to seek out clarification of the questions out into the supply chain community and asking for, asking for assistance, um, support. Is there something that they haven't thought of during their, their sort of tender and engineering process? Is there something out there that they haven't thought of? So those two areas, I think, are quite, are quite key. It's sort of joining, joining operators together joining operators together, uh, but also uh, putting projects together that perhaps may be supply chain led. <clears throat> Traditionally, it's obviously the operator will, will, will place all the contracts, but we're now starting to see a lot more contracts that are uh, projects, sorry, that are supply chain led. In terms of the second question, yes, we do have, we have also signed contracts. Um, we will have the details of the signed contracts on the system, and we'll also have the details of the upcoming tenders. The signed contracts piece, I think is very important for transparency. But it also gives the supply chain that ability. Those those companies lower down the tier, that ability to go and seek seek um, seek out those companies and see if there's any opportunities for them. A novel piece of technology, for instance. I hope that answers it. Great, thank you so much. Um, and I think Rob wanted to come in. Um, and, yes, and if, if I may, that would be great. Um, follow yeah, on that. Well. go ahead. I think I think this is a really interesting um, point that that Moses brings up about you know asking this question and and it you know it came up as well um, in in Waleed's comments you know the publication of the actual supplier contracts and um, you know this I think I think that you know in in the extractive industries transparency movement you know contract transparency uh, which focuses on the the main resource contracts then between the state and the government has has been a sort of a, a big a big movement. Um, and I'm just, I'm not entirely sure that it's a hundred percent needed for, um, su supplier contracts. I think it's, I think it's great, um, where, where that's possible, but I think, I think that these contracts in, in a lot of cases, you know, there, there's sort of a high volume of contracts. They tend to be between two private parties. Um, and so, um, I think in a lot of cases, actually, what, what we probably need here is is um, really good sort of data tools to make sure that information and metadata about these contracts is sort of interoperable. Um, these are the kinds of tools that we see, um, you know, in in public procurement systems. Um, and and I think that the the Pathfinder tool is a good example of that in 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 this area too. And you know, I mean. Just to, I mean, open contracting partnership and the open contracting data standard is a great example of, of a kind of um, tool that, that folks could use to, to sort of base and build out something like that in other countries. So, yeah, and I think that's, but I do think it's a really, really interesting question. I just think that, you know, sometimes we, we need to be careful as a movement that we're not, we're not translating everything from resource contracts to supplier contracts because they're not quite, you know, like for like. And I think that's opening a whole other can of worms. Um, Rob and I started chatting about this yesterday and uh, I have a slightly different viewpoint, um, but definitely agree. Open contracting data standard is a, a tool to pitch it um, that, that could be useful um, in getting some of that information out there. Um, unfortunately, given the time, we're gonna have to stop there, um, but flagging that there are a couple of follow-up questions in the chat for, for Walid, um, a follow-up from Moses on looking forward um, and then one, I think, for EITI from Frederick, um, and then another one for a lead from, from uh, Timor Leste. Um, I think Godwin's question on MSG's role in the energy transition um, in the chat, the separate window, um, Ines has, has shared some information on their thinking. Um, and I do think that that is definitely going to be a topic of future conversation. Um, so uh, thanks so much to, to everyone for the, the really interesting questions and, and responses from our panel. Um, and thanks so much, of course, to EITI for convening this. Um, I think it's been especially interesting for me to dive deeper into some of these questions with y'all um, and looking forward to bringing some of this into our conversations at, at OCP too. Um, but I think as we all can tell, it seems like we've only begun to scratch the surface of all the different issues that are at play here. Uh, we've talked about procurement rules and processes, 
local content or procurement and international regulations, supplier identity and beneficial ownership, um, climate change, energy transition issues, uh, and so much more. So I know this is just the first of many discussions um, around this topic, whether in the Transparency Matters series uh, or beyond. And I'm personally really looking forward to, to what comes next as we sort of work together to make supplier transparency the new norm. So thanks so much, Ines. Thank you so much to the panel and great thanks to you, Kerry, for excellent moderation and thanks to everyone who's been on the line uh, till the end and shared some really helpful uh, questions and comments that uh, we will definitely take with us um, as, as this work continues. So thanks again, everyone, for, uh, for participating in this uh, Transparency Matters uh, webinar. Have a good rest of the day. Mm -hmm.